Well, good evening, and thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to thank Pastor Sexton for the opportunity here uh, to speak tonight. And, uh, of course, thank Pastor for the opportunity to serve in the academy. And thank you all for allowing me to serve alongside of you in the education of your children. And it's been overwhelming, uh, the, the show of support, overwhelming how many people have uh, come to me and said, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for the academy. Let me tell you, I can tell uh, people are praying. I can tell this is a praying church. Uh, many times I visit hospitals and I'll, I'll sit with people in the hospital and they, one thing they say about the Temple Baptist Church is it is a praying church. And what a difference it makes in times of need. And, and I see people in the hospital and pray with them and they, they, they say, and they've always told me, I can tell that people are praying for me. And I can tell you with the beginning of this school year and everything that's happening and, and the show of support, I can tell people are praying for me, praying for my family, praying for the Temple Baptist Academy. Again, it's such a wonderful opportunity and we are so thankful for it. I would like to thank the, the, the principals that are serving with us. They're doing a wonderful job. Uh, Ms. Boer serving as the principal of the middle school. Uh, Mrs. Yates is the, the principal of the elementary school. Uh, Mrs. Robertson is our homeschool coordinator. And just been a wonderful team. Our new office staff, the office administrator, Mrs. Evans, Mrs. Manning in there in the office staff and all the teachers, the faculty, the staff. It's just been a wonderful spirit, a wonderful time. The students, of course, uh, have been wonderful as well, and then the parents, uh, just the opportunity that we have. And again, it's like I say, it's, a, it's an overwhelming opportunity, an overwhelming thing. We have started our first uh, couple of weeks behind us now, our first uh, seven days in the books. Uh, we did uh, get our dual enrollment started this past week. That was very exciting to see our seniors. We have 12, 12 seniors enrolled uh, in the dual enrollment program this year. At least those 12 seniors will graduate with six college credits. We have several others also. We have four in English, uh, three in calculus, one in Comparative World Religions, one in Auto Diesel. As a matter of fact, we have one senior this year that will graduate, had the opportunity to graduate with 16 college credits to his name. That's an entire semester of college under his belt. And uh, we're so excited about that, so grateful for that opportunity to partner with the, the Crown College here. And uh, it's an amazing thing, an amazing thing to see the Lord work in the lives of these young people and, and just do great and wonderful things. Well, I'd like to ask you to take the Word of God with me and turn to the book of Revelation tonight. Uh, the Revelation of Jesus Christ... Chapter number 6, we'll begin reading in verse number 12, Revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter number 6, verse number 12. You, you cannot turn on the television today, uh, or this weekend, or this past week without hearing something about the solar eclipse and what's going on, so I'd like to turn to the book of Revelation and begin reading in here, verse number 12, and I, I want to make this statement before we jump into this. What we're reading tonight has nothing to do with tomorrow. Now, the events described in this passage are not describing the events that will happen tomorrow, all right? So everybody, please rest assured, the end of the earth is not coming tomorrow with the solar eclipse. However, I do believe when God gives us these natural phenomena, it's a wonderful chance that we can take and look at God's word and look to the future events and look to these things that God has for us. And as you think about the eclipse tomorrow, maybe you'll think about this passage and, and the challenge that I'll bring to you tonight. And there's one question I want to ask tonight and it's brought to us from God's word and I want to just examine that question. But let's begin reading here now in verse number 12. It says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand. And I want you, if you're in the habit of marking your Bible, look at the last part of that uh, verse number 17. As these men hide themselves in the mountains and the rock, they ask this question, who shall be able to stand? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll jump right into this. Lord and Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this opportunity to gather in this place, Lord, in your presence. We just ask now you'd open up our hearts, open up our ears, our mind, Lord, to your word, to the working of your Holy Spirit. Father, help me now to move out of the way. And Father, just to let your spirit move through this message. 
Uh, Lord, that souls would be convicted. Uh, Father, if there's one here in this place tonight, even tonight, that is unsure of their salvation, Father, we just pray and ask that you would work in their hearts now, work in their lives. And Father, we just pray that they would come to know you tonight as their Savior. And Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to become a better people, a better Christians, Lord, serving you. And help to change our lives tonight as we leave this place. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. And we come to this book of Revelation. And we realize this book of Revelation, the human penman, is John the Beloved. Uh, one of the closest disciples to Jesus Christ, a man uh, on Christ's inner circle, uh, a man that was so close to Jesus, he sat next to him at the, at the Lord's Supper and, and placed his head upon the breast of Jesus. He was that close. Uh, as a matter of fact, when Jesus was on the cross dying, he looked to John and, and looked to his uh, mother, his earthly mother Mary, and, and said, Behold thy mother. In other words, he says, John, I want you now to take care of my mom. I want you to take care of Mary like she was your own mother. Uh, that's what Jesus Christ thought of John. That's the closest relationship they had. Of course, John, we know from history, had been, they had tried to kill him. They had tried to martyr him. He survived. And they banished him to the Isle of Patmos. And it was on this island uh, that the Lord comes to him and reveals to him this vision and instructs him to write it and send it to seven churches in Asia Minor. Uh, the, uh, the vision itself is given, the, the, the theme of it is given in Revelation chapter number one, verse number 19, when Jesus tells him, write these things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And of course, we know this book of Revelation deals a lot with end times, a lot with what's going to happen uh, during the end times of this world, what we call the tribulation period. And as we come to the fifth and sixth chapter of Revelation, we see the Lamb... Uh, who was worthy to open the scroll, and he's given a scroll with seven seals on it. I personally believe, uh, through Bible study, that this uh, scroll uh, represents the title deed to the earth, and this, this passage here in chapter number six is revealing Jesus Christ preparing his earth, preparing the earth for what I would say is foreclosure, right? Jesus is getting ready to foreclose upon the earth. He's getting ready to come back to, to take possession back of the earth and to hold account the debtors uh, therein. And they call this day the great day of his wrath. That's what the, the book here in Revelation calls this, the great day of his wrath. Many people conjecture about this great day. Many preachers preach great and wonderful sermons. And I tell you, just about as many preachers preach sermons, there's just as many charlatans who try to capitalize on this topic. They try to sell books. They try to sell conspiracy theories. Uh, they've written volumes on these things. Uh, of all the material that man has written, though, regarding this great day, I do know two things for sure. There's two things I know for sure regarding this great day. Number one, it is coming. The Lord is coming, and I believe he's coming soon to claim his earth and to claim his own. Number two, uh, the other thing I know for sure is only the Lord knows when that day will be. Now, I was alive in 1988. I know not everybody in here was, and, uh, but I was alive in 1988. And I do remember a man writing a book, 88 Reasons the Lord Will Come Back in 88. And I can tell you this, that there's no time or date that you can set. There's no magic formula you can pick out, no algorithm you can set or, or figure out the, the aligning of the stars or how many eclipses happen and whatever paths they cross. You're not going to predict when the Lord's coming back. Only God knows uh, when the Lord comes. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew 24, 36, of that day and hour knoweth no man. So stop worrying yourself with trying to find the day. Stop worrying yourself with conspiracy theories and books and thoughts and ideas. And just know those two things. Number one, the day of the Lord is coming. It is sure. It will happen. And number two, only God knows when it'll happen. Now we look at this day and we start thinking about this day and what God has done and, and told us about this day. There's a question that is asked at the end of this passage. It says, who shall be able to stand? And it's this question I'd like to explore this evening. If you'll take your Bibles, turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 13. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 13, we have another picture of this same day as Isaiah pens in 13. We'll begin reading in Isaiah, chapter number 13. In verse number one, I just want to read through this all the way down uh, through verse number 13. It says in verse number one of Isaiah 13, it says, The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see, lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, 
heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint and every man's heart shall melt and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them and they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flame. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. We have here in the book of Isaiah a description of the same day that John gives us in the book of Revelation. And Isaiah calls it the day... Of the Lord. He says, The day of the Lord cometh. The day of the Lord is at hand. And, and beloved, this evening I want to let you know the day of the Lord is at hand. There is nothing that needs to happen. There is nothing that needs to be fulfilled. There is no prophecy left undone that would prevent the coming of the Lord today. At any moment, the trump shall sound. At any moment, uh, we shall be changed at his, his, his church and we will be raptured to meet him in the clouds of heaven. And I'm looking forward to that day. But I want to ask you today, in that day, in that day of the Lord, who shall be able to stand. And I believe here in the book of Isaiah, chapter number three, uh, he describes these people in three different ways. He gives us three different pictures, three different stories uh, that he tells us and describes these people that will be able to stand in the day of the Lord, the sanctified ones. He says, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger and them that rejoice in my highness. And I want to look at this idea of my sanctified ones, my mighty ones, and them that rejoice in my high, highness. Who shall be able to stand? Those who are sanctified. Those who have been prepared. Those who have been set apart. Set apart for service. Set apart by God. Exodus chapter number 29. If you'll turn with me there in the book of Exodus. God gives us a picture of the sanctification as he talks to Moses. And describes the sanctification process in the tabernacle. And what the nation of Israel would go through for sanctification and the priests there in the tabernacle for the work of God. And in Exodus chapter number 29 and verse number 42, God gives Moses this commandment. He says, this shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak there unto thee. And there I will meet with the children of Israel and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. I want you to understand what this work of sanctification is, this work of separation, this work of preparation of God's people to himself. I want you to understand, number one, this work is done by the glory of God, and it's through the glory of God that this work is done. There's no work you can do. There's no one thing that you can have or you can say or you can be. There's no amount of money you can pay. There's no way to purchase this, but it's through God's glory, and as God's glory comes down, uh, he brings his sanctification to the people. And you'll see there, it's not only through God's glory, but it's also through God's presence. Through God's presence, it talks about, I will dwell among the children of Israel and I will dwell among them. I am the Lord, their God, in verse number 45 and 46. About God's presence, it's about God's glory. But number three, it's also, it's a work of preparation for service. In verse number 44, he says, I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons. So historically, as we see the beginning of this work of the tabernacle, God explains to Moses, you are going to build this place where I am going to come and dwell with you. And the tabernacle we know is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ to come. And as God is telling Moses, I will sanctify you uh, and I will come and dwell with you in this place in the tabernacle, I'm giving you a picture that one day I will come in the flesh as the son of God and I will die for your sins. And through that death, 
I will sanctify you for my purpose. And let me tell you tonight, if you're going to stand in the day of the Lord, you must be a sanctified one. You must be one that is set apart. You must be one that is prepared for a holy work. You must be one that has come into God's presence and, and experienced God's glory through God's son uh, for the purpose of being prepared to work for him. A sanctified one. Let me tell you this, it is not an emotional experience. It is not something that you can whip up, some type of idea or some type of event or some type of, of musical experience or emotional experience or something you can just say, well, I know. Uh, talking to people about salvation, you hear uh, lots of different things, you hear lots of different stories. And one thing I hear a lot of times is, well, I was in this accident or I, I had this thing happen to me and all of a sudden I just saw this bright light and I just know that it was God and I just had this overwhelming sense of something come over me and now I know that I'm saved. Hey, let me tell you, what it's not an emotional experience. No near-death experience can sanctify. No near-death experience can wash away your sin. There's nothing emotional about it. It's not an emotional experience. Number two, it's not an educational experience. No amount of education no number of degrees. There's no title you can put in front of your name. There's no amount of books you can read, no amount of knowledge you can have that will create this sanctifying work in your life. It's not an educational experience. You may go to school. You may graduate from the best schools, the greatest schools. You may study your whole life, but you will not receive the sanctification through an education. Number three, I want you to know it's not an environmental experience. There's no place you can go. I love the Temple Baptist Church. My family loves the Temple Baptist Church. We thank God daily for the, the day he brought us here and the way he moved uh, to bring our family from Ohio down to Tennessee and, uh, and, and just found a home for us in this place. But let me tell you, the Temple Baptist Church is not this building. It is not the pew you're sitting in. It is not this place. And coming to this place does not make you a Christian. Coming to this place will not create God's sanctifying work in your life. Coming to this place will not separate you for God's purpose. It is not an environmental experience. There's no place you can separate yourself to. You cannot go out and trek off into the woods and live on, on the land and, and just pray and, and God will meet you there. That's not how it happens. This is a personal work of God in your life. It is a work of God and a work of God alone. If you'll turn to the book of 1 Corinthians with me, book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, I want you to see what the New Testament has to say here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 9. It says this, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. And notice what it says. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of, your, of our God. Hey, let me tell you, if you're going to stand in the day of the Lord, if you're going to be able to stand, who shall be able to stand? My sanctified ones. Let me ask you tonight, has there been a moment where Jesus Christ has sanctified you? Have you been set apart by the blood of Jesus Christ? Have you come to the Lord Jesus Christ admitting that you're a sinner, understanding uh, the sin that's in your life and knowing uh, that there's nothing you can do, there's no way you can try, there's no uh, thing you can do, there's no place you can go, there's no person you can be, but it's only through the person of Jesus Christ and it's only through his shed blood. And you've come to Jesus Christ and you've admitted that you're a sinner and you've asked him to save your soul. Has that happened this evening? Are you sanctified? Are you set apart? Are you special? And I want to tell you, if you are saved, you say, Brother Jeff, I, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I've put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, you are a special one. You have been saved for a reason. You have been pulled out of the mud and the mire of this world. You have been cleaned by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hey, live like it. Live like it. Live like you have a purpose. Live like you have a reason. Live like God is doing something in your life. What, what a, a disappointment it is to me as a parent when I have a child 
and they come in and they're so dirty and, and, and gross and you know, cause kids get dirty and gross. That's what happens when you're a child, you're out playing. I think it's a great thing. I think kids should play. I think kids should get dirty. But then there comes that time, it's bath time, right? They gotta go take a bath, right? And they go get clean. And, uh, and, and then it's such a disappointment and such a heartache because it's such a difficult thing to get them in the bath. And as soon as they get out of the bath, they go right back to the mud. They get dirty again and they get all, all, all dirtied up. And it's a weak example of salvation, but what about that Christian that God has pulled you out of the world, pulled you out of the mire of sin and, and, and created you for this special purpose, set you apart, prepared you for his service and you just wanna go right back to what he pulled you out of. You just wanna go right back to that life of sin. You just wanna go right back and do whatever you wanna do. And, and it's awful. It's awful. Listen, if you're a Christian tonight, you're a sanctified one. Live like it. Live like you've been set apart. Live like you have a purpose. Sanctification is not a work, is, is only a work of God, a work of God and God alone. And, and it can only be done in the life of a believer. So if you're to answer the question, who shall be able to stand? You must ask yourself, am I a sanctified one? Will I be able to stand? Am I a sanctified one? Have I come to the Lord Jesus Christ? And let me ask you, if you don't know Christ as your savior, make tonight that night. There's no time to lose. The moment can come at any time where Christ ransoms his people, raptures his church out of this place and will be gone. And, and the time can come at any moment, the sanctified ones. Number two, notice back in the book of Isaiah, he says, my mighty ones. Isaiah talks about the sanctified ones, but he also calls them mighty ones. This is a name for warriors in the Bible. In Isaiah chapter number 13, verse number three, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger. This group is described as God's warriors. And listen, this is what you need to understand is nothing within yourself that makes you worthy to be called God's warriors, to be called God's mighty ones. But it is only the work of God in your life, in your life. What, it, what does it take to be a mighty one? What does it take to be a warrior in God's army? What does it take to have that happen? Psalm chapter number 33, if you'll turn there with me, describes the mighty ones. Psalm chapter number 33. And I want to begin reading here in Psalm chapter number 33, verse number 13. Psalm 33, 13 says this. The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. And horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. If you'll notice there in verse number, in verse number 16, the Bible says there, there is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A mighty man. So many times we look at men and we try to think of men as mighty men. We try to describe mighty men in our own terms, in our own thoughts, in our own ideas. We might have this great high and lofty idea of what the mighty man looks like. And we may think of a position. We may think of a title. We may think of power, influence, money, fame, wealth. We may think of all of these different things. God doesn't look at those things. He says here in this verse, he says, a mighty man is not delivered by much strength. In other words, what makes a man mighty is not measured by how much he can do. What makes a man mighty is not measured by how much he can do. Now, God's word tells us this. A mighty man is not in what he can do. And then it goes on to describe what a mighty man really is. In verses number 18 through 22, look at it with me. What is a truly mighty man? God describes it there for us. Beginning in verse number 18, he says, A mighty man, behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. So we see a mighty man fears God. Of course, Proverbs chapter number one, verse number seven, Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord 
is the beginning of knowledge. We understand the fear of God is where it begins. And we have to come to this idea, this realization within ourselves that it all begins with God and that we must begin with God. And if we're going to be a mighty man, if we're going to be a mighty man of God, we must begin in our life with God. And we've heard pastors say many times, God is always previous. It all begins with God. Uh, that's, that's where it all starts. And listen, you may be trying tonight to begin with something else, to begin somewhere else. It doesn't begin there. It begins with God. Number two, he says, not only do they fear God, they hope in his mercy. Verse number 18, uh, they, the, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, hope in his mercy. Psalm chapter number 118, uh, verses number one and two, Psalm 118, verses number one and two says this, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. And we see a man that hopes in God's mercy, hopes in eternal, sees the world in its eternity and takes the long view in life. As pastors always told us, we need to live with eternity's values in view, living, seeing the big picture, seeing our life is more than just right here. Sadly, most people and most Christians included live life right here. It's what's right in front of them. And that's all they can see is the next three seconds, the next three seconds, the next three seconds. And we need to take a step back and we need to look at our life. We need to think way down the road. Something I try to encourage uh, the teenagers, the high schoolers that I deal with on a daily basis, I, I try to ask them, listen, you need to take a look at your life and think many years down the road, when am I at the end of my life? How will my life have affected those that have come into it? Picture yourself at the end of it all. And how will your life have affected those things? What will your life have stood for? One thing that's very important as we think of beginning with God, and as we think of finishing strong, living with eternal values in view, we think of our worldview. I have the privilege to teach chemistry class this year uh, in the high school. It's something I, my heart's close to, obviously, as a, as a pharmacist, a, a chemist, if you will, applied chemist is what pharmacy basically is. So I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I spent the first week, though, discussing worldview with our students, getting them to understand what that means, having the proper worldview. When we live our life, we live our life looking at the world through lenses. And we have to come to this understanding of what do we believe about the world, because that will shape what we think and feel about the world. And when we come to this, we must believe, we must understand that this world, there's so much more to it. This physical world, this matter that we see is not the reality of our life. Reality is in eternity. Reality is in the things we don't see. And we need to live our life understanding that. We need to live our life understanding it begins with God and it ends with God. We need to live our life understanding that it's gonna last much longer than the 80 or 90 years we may live. It'll last into eternity. Decisions we make now will last into eternity. Live with eternal values in view. Number three, look at what it says. Number three, there in, in Isaiah, I'm sorry, not in Isaiah, we're in Psalm 33. In Psalm 33, in verse number 19, it says, to deliver their soul from death, to keep them alive in famine. Verse number 20, our soul waiteth for the Lord. Our soul waiteth. The mighty man waits on the Lord. Psalm 24, 7, 14 says, wait on the Lord and be of good courage, right? Be of good courage. And this waiting on the Lord uh, creates this courage in our life, understanding and knowing that we don't have to fight in our own strength. We don't have to charge in headlong in our own strength. We're not, not doing it on our own, but God is with us and we can wait on God and we can wait on the Lord and we can fight in his might. And this gives us the courage then to do the impossible like Brother Tim was talking about this morning. It gives us the courage to do things that nobody's ever done before and to attempt great things for God, expecting great things from God and understanding that we have this courage. So we need to begin with God. We need to finish strong. We need to have courage. And lastly, it talks about trusting in his name, the mighty men. It says in verse 21, for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. And the mighty men trust in the Lord. Again, in Psalm 118, eight through nine, Psalm 118, eight through nine, it says, uh, it is better to have confidence in the Lord I'm sorry, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. And we understand this trusting in the Lord gives us confidence. We can have a boldness now in, in God because we're trusting in God and we can live our life with boldness. We can live our life with courage. We can live our life knowing uh, what's coming. So we begin with God. 
We finish strong, we have courage, and we're bold. Listen, a truly mighty man is not measured by how much he can do, but by how much he allows the Lord to do through him. Uh, James Zinker, Brother Zinker preached here uh, not too long ago, and he made this statement. I wrote it down in my Bible. God without man is still God. But man without God is nothing. So let me ask you, where is God in your life? Are you a mighty man? A mighty man, I said earlier, a mighty man is not measured by how much he can do. A mighty man is measured by how much he allows the Lord to do through him. Are you a mighty man? Are you allowing the Lord to work through your life? Are you allowing the Lord to work in your life? We're mighty only when we are in the Lord. Who shall be able to stand? The mighty ones. Are you a mighty one? Ask yourself this question, who am I living for? Who am I living for? When I wake up in the morning, who am I thinking about? When I go to sleep at night, what are my last thoughts at night? I, again, I ask my high schoolers this question, how long does it take you to think of God in the morning? It's a convicting thought sometimes, isn't it? How long does it take? Are you a mighty one? Are you a sanctified one? The last thing uh, the book of Isaiah brings to us is this idea of them that rejoice in my highness, them that rejoice in my highness. And of course, we understand this last phrase found in Isaiah 3 references back to Isaiah chapter number six, talking about our vision of God, our vision of God. And we all know this passage, our, our pastor has preached off of it and it's a wonderful passage, uh, one, of my, one of my favorites, if you will. But in Isaiah chapter number six, verse number one, I'll read this for you. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. With twain, he covered his feet. With twain, he did fly. And one cried out another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I send me. Of course, we see from this passage, Isaiah got this vision of God. And uh, all the passages, if you read the first five chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah uh, gets to preaching and he gets to speaking to the nation of Israel. And he's pointing out all the faults in Israel. And he keeps saying, woe is, and woe is, and woe is. And he's pointing at all the people and woe is you, and woe is you. And the judgment of God is coming upon Israel. And then he comes to Isaiah chapter number six and he's arrested with this vision. And he sees the Lord high and lifted up, it says, in the holy temple. And immediately the vision of God that Isaiah has uh, gives him a vision of himself as he truly is. And his self-righteousness is just gone. And he sees himself as a man with unclean lips and a man who's undone. And he sees his need of God in his life and that he's not worthy to be in the presence of God. And let me ask you this, how big is the God you serve? Do you serve a God that's high and lifted up? Do you serve a God that's thrice holy? Or do you serve a God that's just kind of there for you? Is he your fashion statement? You just kind of pull him out when the time is right. When you're in church on Sunday morning or when you're in a group of people that are talking about God, then it's okay to pull him out. Uh, some people try to put God on like they put on a, a tie or a belt buckle. It's just the next fashion statement. And when it's convenient for me, when it's convenient for me, then, then I can pull pull God into the conversation. No, Isaiah says, I am unclean, I am undone. I see God for who he is. He is a God that fills the temple. His train fills the temple. His train is ever consuming, uh, permeating my life. And I am unclean uh, because of the man I am in God's presence. What kind of God do you serve? This vision of God gives us a vision of ourselves, a realization of our current situation, which leads to his separating experience his separating experience. As that angel takes that coal off the, off the altar and lays it on his lips, you see a separating of Isaiah. He now is purged of his sin and he is now ready for service. The separating experience leads to a servant's heart so that when God asks the question, who will go for us? There's Isaiah, here am I, Lord. 
send me. Have you ever wondered sometimes in your life why God isn't saying who will go for us? You just can't hear that question in your life. You just wonder, what does God have for me? I can't see the will of God for my life. I just don't understand. I don't know what's happening. Have you ever thought maybe you have the wrong vision of God? Maybe you have the wrong vision of yourself. Maybe you've not had this separating work. God is wanting to ask you the question, who will go for us? He's just waiting for that work in your life to come about. So have you, are you one that rejoices in God's highness? Are you one that sees God as he truly is high and lifted up? Are you serving a big God? Who shall be able to stand those that rejoice in God's highness? Now, I said all that to say this back in Revelation chapter number six, verse number 17. Back in Revelation chapter number six, verse number 17, it asks the question, who shall be able to stand? In that great day, there is nothing that you have done. There is no great work of any man that will be able to stand. As a matter of fact, verse number 15, it says, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. There's nothing this earth has to offer you. There's nothing this world has to offer you. There's nothing this life that can give or can bring that will allow you to stand in that day. There's just one thing. And that's the Lord. If you turn over to the book of Revelation chapter number 12, Verses number 10 and 11, it says this, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accused of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Will you be able to stand when that great day comes? Have you overcome by the blood of the lamb? Can you say that you are a sanctified one? Can you say that you are a mighty man? Can you say that you're rejoicing in his highness? Do you have the right vision of God? Will your prayer be the prayer of John in in Revelation chapter number 20, verse number 20, 22, 20, where he says, even so come Lord Jesus. Can that be your prayer tonight? Who shall be able to stand? Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. We go to Lord in prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed. When that great day comes, it's coming soon. No man knows when. It will come. Will you be able to stand? Lord and Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word. Thankful for this opportunity now. Help us to act. Lord, help us to act on what you've given us, what you've spoken to our hearts about. We ask these things now in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.